So Rav Shuki uh, took a little bit of my introduction, uh, which was that I'm a user and I'm not, uh, at least not yet, working for uh, Herzog in any official capacity. I wanted to start like this. Just raise your hand if you've used a Taratanach, just visited or played around a little bit. And raise your hand if you spend significant amount of time there. Okay, and raise your hand if you use it for preparing your classes. Okay, so that's a, 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 a small sampling. Um, I would say I would put myself in the category of those that use it more extensively. As uh, Rav Shuki said, we've spent some time over the course of this year um, kind of having a chavruta talking about both learning Tanakh and also using technology for it. So with that, within that context, I am a user of the site and I want to present a little bit my understanding of the goals of the site. I'm not going to walk through all of the different capabilities of the site. Of course, I'm going to, cut, I'm going to touch on hopefully many of them, but I want to put those capabilities within the context of the way I understand what Michlel Herzog represents as a study of Tanakh. Um, and I also would like to learn a little bit because I think that's the point of the site. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's open it up. Uh, and if you open it up on Parshat Shavua, you come to a screen like this where you see um, a little bit, a few psukim and some of the categories that, uh, that, uh, that they set up for you on the site. Um, I'm going to jump ahead now uh, to just looking at Sefer Dvarim, opening up to Sefer Dvarim. I'm looking at the psukim here. Okay, I get to see a nice uh, view of the psukim. I'm, I'm not aligned properly here. Uh, <clears throat> and now I'm just going to sort of use the site a little bit uh, with you uh, to learn a little bit about Sefer Dvarim. Now, uh, why, uh, why Sefer Dvarim? Um, so first of all, Parshat Shavuah, obviously the easiest one. But also, uh, in my experience teaching, and I guess I should give a little bit of background, I spent a number of years uh, teaching in a modern Orthodox high school in Cleveland, Fuchs Mizrahi School, uh, before I made Aliyah. And then, uh, once I made Aliyah, I spent a small amount of time running around to different institutions here. And then, in the age-old question of Chinuch in Chutzlaretz or computers in Israel, I chose both. Um, and now I'm f primarily focused on computers, and we'll get, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. So when I look at uh, uh, the way Hatanach presents Sefer Dvarim, um, I see on the side here I have all these options. I can look at the Targumim, I can look at uh, Parshanim, maps, articles, uh, audio, video, etc. If I click on articles, and I don't know, maybe I'll just by chance happen to choose an article that I might have looked at before um, from Dr. Rabbi Dr. Tamir Granot, these are the words, okay? Um, to uh, avoid uh, slow ups, I've already opened the, up the different ones. Okay, so I. I'm telling you, this is not what it looks like when I open it. I mean, I, I get the same thing. Responsiveness in, uh, in Hebrew and. Uh, in Hebrew. Yeah, so we're going to uh, avoid some of the, the technical issues. This is not a training session, so. Uh, so I'm in the English one, and I'll, I'll, I'll just walk you through it. If you have questions about the technicals, we can talk about that later in the course of the day. But I'm going to sort of walk through it. It's a demonstration and not a training session. So let's be, be clear about that. OK, so when I open up this article, the first thing I get is a nice little summary of it. These are the words, Elah Advarim, Parshat Dvarim, from Rabbi Dr. Tamir Granot. Three elements emphasize the uniqueness of Sefer Dvarim in the context of the Torah. It is a speech. The contents are, to a large extent, a repetition, what we often associate with the idea of Mishneh Torah. And the author of the book was Moshe instead of God. Okay, those are three characteristics that we're all familiar with. It's a speech from Moshe, written and not from Hashem. Abarbanel believes Moshe wrote the book by God's command. Okay, that's something that we're not going to get into, but that is an expansion of this idea. What does it mean that Moshe wrote the book? And it's part of the Torah. Um, <coughs> Rab Tzadok wrote that Dvarim is the start of the oral Torah a reflection of God's Torah in man's creation. Dvarim turns God's past revelation into an ongoing present day fact. Okay, this is already a, a new kind of idea about what it means that Moshe taught Sefer Dvarim, and it's the beginning of the, um, uh, the oral Torah. That's an idea that we're gonna hold on to. Okay, but I'm just continuing now, and from here, I can click on posts, and again, I'll just sort of randomly choose a post that I may have looked at before and already opened up another tab. And that's a post from Rabbanit Dr. Michal Tikachinsky. Okay, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Posts are, in general, shorter. Uh, but as we saw, oh, let me just make sure I didn't skip this, right? That was the, 
Uh, that was the summary of the article. If you go down the if you then click here, you get to download the entire article, which of course has a lot more detail. When I look now at this particular uh, post, the post itself is longer, but it's all here. Um, uh, Rabanit uh, Tikachinsky is talking about the word biur. Okay, so if we go back to the, the psukim here, I'm going to hide that and look at the psukim. It talks about Diber Moshe, but then in Pasuke it says, We'll come back to this later, but in this article here, Dr. Dr. Tikachinsky talks about this word biur, and she gives a number of explanations, and I'm going to do something totally not fair. I'm just going to skip to the end and read her conclusion. This is not the way we train our students to learn, but sometimes as teachers we take a little bit of shortcuts. Let's just look at the end. Therefore, at the beginning of Sefer Dvarim, right before his death, we encounter Moshe's first real interaction with the nation in the fullest meaning of what an interaction is, I assume she explained that earlier. We're not going to get into that. Until now, Moshe said, Diber. Now Moshe is explaining Be'er. Perhaps at the end of his life, facing his humanity, Moshe succeeds in connecting with the nation that he led for so long and sees the world from their point of view. He succeeds not only in saying the Torah, but giving over the meaning. He reads the Torah from the viewpoint of a receiver of the Torah, and not only from the viewpoint of the giver of the Torah. And in this, he transforms from a giver into a teacher. So uh, again, I think there's a lot of things that she talks about in this article, but this idea that Be'er is sort of the beginning, the introduction to the idea of Moshe Rabbeinu, the teacher. Okay, so now I'm starting to swim in these ideas. I'm getting into um, what are the possibilities that I can figure out in Sefer Dvarim? I'm just looking at the beginnings, the introduction to an article, and uh, skipping around in a little bit of a post. I'm already sort of deep into my thinking about Sefer Dvarim, and this is a way I can sort of explore and to some degree get lost in Atara Tanakh. Okay, but wait. Um, we call this innovation and technology in support of classroom teaching. Now, um, this is kind of great because certainly when I started teaching in Cleveland about 20 years ago, right, it wasn't so easy for me to track down the Migadim article that I thought I remembered about the, about the uh, section that I was going to teach the following year and having it on Atar Tanakh is great, right? But what exactly is innovation and technology about having all the stuff that Herzog has produced over the years and just putting it online? So. Um, is it innovation? Is it technology? Now here, what I'd like to do is put on my other hat and say that um, certainly since the, the time that I made Aliyah about 12 years ago, I've been focused primarily in a job as a programmer and working in technology. I work at a company called Five Blocks and we do digital reputation management. You should never know of such a thing. No, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a reasonable activity for many companies to organize their digital information. If we have time, I will uh, refer to a specific thing that we do later on. Um, but uh, in that context, um, as a web programmer and someone who's very involved with what goes on in Google and online, um, I would say I have a little bit of a, uh, I would say this is, I've formulated for myself a kind of definition of what is innovation and technology when we talk about the internet. Okay, and I'd like to sort of explain my view of internet technology and innovation and then apply that to Atara Tanakh uh, and then uh, expand a little bit more. So innovation and technology, I want to talk about three things. First of all, content, access, and tools. Content, access, and tools. And I'm going to uh, refer to some of the uh, digital rebehem to, uh, to explain some of these concepts. So let's start with content. Um, Bill Gates in 1996 wrote what many consider a very prophetic article that he called content is king. Okay, this is sort of the beginning of the internet as a useful tool. And he wrote how uh, the engine of the internet is really content. Now what he meant was the way to make money off of the internet is content. But 
What he meant by that also was that the fundamental value of what people look for on the internet is content. And if you think about the sites that you don't just visit from time to time, but you kind of live on. So for me, that's ESPN. For many people, it might be uh, the New York Times or Times of Israel or whatever site you live on. It's because you're constantly looking for new content. Content is king. And this is not a small part of what the internet is. This is a huge part of what the internet is. Creating content, new content, original content, or fake content, which is a lot of what, probably what most of what the internet is, uh, that is a huge part of what's going on. So now we focus in on Herzog and Hatanakh.com, and I think we can say very clearly in here, I'm in a position to say this in part because I don't work for Herzog yet, again. Um, Herzog is a global content leader for contemporary religious Tanakh study. And I think that all of you in this room and all of you that participate in these days are certainly on board with this statement. And again, it's not a, it's not a coincidence and it's certainly not surprising that right, I've, I've been coming to the Yemei Yun, not every year, but on and off for 20 years, right? And the amount of content that's created uh, in this institution is really overwhelming. And the idea that we now have a place to access that content is a fundamental um, uh, innovation, I think, in, uh, 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 in our ability to learn and understand the Tanakh. Um, so this is a fundamental principle, I think, in understanding what the internet is, and certainly how Tanakh is providing this, is providing content at a very high level that I think at least all of us in this room, and hopefully some other people that are not in this room, want to access. That's our content is king. Um, the second part is access. I'll turn to another, uh, not an individual, but an organization, right? I spend a lot of time thinking about Google, okay? Um, basically, in online reputation management, we look at your Google results and we try to help you understand how you can make them better. What is Google's mission statement? Google claims that their job, they're not a search engine, their job, their goal is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. That's kind of a big goal. They've done a lot of things towards that, in including like scanning every book in the world uh, and giving you access to all sorts of information. Now, when we think of Google, we fundamentally think about uh, search. And search basically lets you find anything in what we call an unstructured way. I don't know exactly what I'm looking for, but if I can guess the keywords, then uh, I have a pretty good chance of getting what I want. And the amazing thing about Google is that they're smart enough to kind of guess what people mean. And that's a lot of what they do. OK, so we'll say right here, as far as I know, and again, I don't work for the site, um, the search part of Atara Tanakh is being developed. Um, they know that there's a ver very significant value for working out how to search, searching within the Tanakh, searching within their articles. That's a big part of what needs to happen. Currently, that's not uh, quite as functional as they would like it to be. But I want to point out another thing. What's my time, Sean? I'm all confused because I didn't start it. Uh, you have 15 minutes. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, so then we'll take a short um, uh, detour into the world of reputation management. Okay, so I want to show you something. When I search Herzog College in Google, I don't just get sort of the standard uh, results over here. I also get that thing on the side, right? What we call the knowledge panel. What is that? Google knows, or they think they know, what Herzog College is. It's not just a search term. It's an online entity. It exists. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. It has attributes. And Google thinks they know the attributes of Herzog, so they show it to you. They have a logo there. They have a location and a map. And they have a little blurb that comes from probably Wikipedia, OK? What is, what, what's happening here? Well, Wiki, underneath Wikipedia or related to Wikipedia is another online entity connected that's called Wikidata. Wikidata is a database where you can enter information in categories. Now, this is very significant because Google search, you just search anything. But underneath, what Google really wants is structured information. And they have a whole um, tutorial and explanation on, on, on their site for people that are building websites, how to feed Google structured information so they know no, more about what you're giving them. They know names, entity names, and relationships. That's what Google really wants to do. They want to understand something. Now, why do I go into this little detour? Um, 
about uh, entities and structured and structured information, in part to sort of justify or explain one of the significant values that uh, HaTanakh gives us. Atar HaTanakh, again, the search part of it is perhaps not as robust as we would like it to be, but they've done a very significant uh, job in creating uh, structured information. So, and here I'm just going to sort of throw it out at you. We already saw that on the left bar uh, you had access to articles and posts and audio shurim that were connected to the chapter that you were looking at. Okay, so what, what HaTanakh has done is they've created, and this is all manual work, right? This is intelligent work. This is not algorithmic work, right? They've created topics and they've associated topics with every section in the Tanakh so that you can understand that in Dvarim Perak Alf, Moshe's address, and now they've connected articles to that, so you can move, you can get from that chapter to different articles connected to it. They've also connected personalities, so that you can find where different people are in different parts of the Tanakh, and then find articles about those different people. Okay? They've also, we saw that uh, the idea that they've summarized every article, that's a different kind of access. It's also a different kind of content, right? Migadim, you get, the, you get the journal, you expect to spend some time reading through all those pages. When you're online, you're not exactly in that mode. And the idea that they've summarized every article and given you a blurb so you, now you have that initial access, you could read the whole, ar ar whole article, or you could just go on assuming that you know exactly what they meant and teach your students that way. Um, and then the other, um, additionally, at the bottom of each article, They've done this article mapping where they connect this article to other articles and shurim that might be connected to it. Okay, so by doing that, at the beginning I talked about entering into a parak in Tanakh and sort of getting lost there and learning and, and then not knowing where to stop. Really, it's even deeper than that because now I can move from one article to the next. I'm reading Rabbi Dr. Tamir Granot, but there's Rabbi Menachem Liebte giving an audio share. Maybe I'll listen to that on the way to work. Right? And then I'll try to figure out how those things are connected. Additionally, um, in this article, on the bottom of it, it connects the article categorically. From that category, I can then get to another article. Okay? So on the bottom, the opening verses of Sefer Dvarim from Dr. Mordechai Sabato, that's an article that, I wanna, that we're going to take a look at uh, in, in a minute. Okay, so here, what we see is that uh, Hatanah, the Hatanach website not only provides us high quality content that certainly everyone in this room is interested in, but we think a lot of other people are interested in also, but also gives us a certain way of accessing that content. Okay, now part of it is a learning process, understanding how do I navigate through the site, how do I get to what I think is important, how do I move through that, and that's again something I think that uh, I know that uh, Rav Shuki is thinking about, how do we maybe build pathways through the site, so you don't just get lost. Getting lost is fun also, but having a, having a guide can also be useful. Um, so that's another way to think about moving forward, how you could have maybe a path through the site. Uh, hopefully that will, that will uh, be something that we work on more uh, this year. The third aspect of technology, especially internet technology, I think at some level is the most obvious, tools. Right? We often think about using internet tools, and that is, as the, basic, the most basic level, a word processing tool, Google Docs, if we're, we're uh, focused on internet tools, right? a tool that allows me to do my work. Okay, at some level, that is the most obvious thing. I think this is a very much a setup for what my colleagues are going to say, even though I don't know what they're going to say exactly, um, but a little bit of the focus on, on the tools. I want to now talk about some of the tools on Atara Tanakh, but I want to do it through, um, through looking at another article. So if we, go back, uh, if we go back to the website, uh, so first of all, there's some basic things that I would consider a tool. First of all, the layout of the Tanakh, which I think is done very nicely here. The ability to expand this and to include Parshanim alongside your reading of the Psukim. I know uh, I'm going to do something that's completely not fair. Uh, Rav Shuki has done entire sessions where he talks about how I can look at the Parshanim and notice things in the Psukim and have the Parshanim next to him, and I'm just going to say, it's a nice thing to do, uh, and he can show you a different time. Um, but there's a couple of obvious tools, the inclusion of the Targumim, the commentaries. I now want to look, I want to walk through a reading of this Rev Sabato article uh, in 10 minutes? Uh, eight minutes. Eight minutes, okay. Uh, in eight minutes, uh, at, and through that, try to demonstrate some of the tools. 
Um, okay, so <clears throat> again, we're going to start with the uh, um, this uh, summary of the article from Dr. Mordechai Sabato. The Torah introduces Sefer Dvarim by informing the reader that we are about to read Moshe's words as addressed to the nation of Israel in the land of Moab, close to the end of the 40th year. No such introduction exists for any other Sefer. And this is an indication of the uni uniqueness of Sefer Dvarim, in line with what we saw earlier from um, Rabbi Dr. Granot. The great majority of Dvarim consists of a record of the speeches that Moshe delivers at the end of the desert journeying. Sefer Dvarim includes almost no narration of events that happen to the nation or direct divine commands. In this sense, it is different from the other four books of the Torah. Again, something that we're already um, familiar with right now from what we saw earlier. This shiur will attempt to address the significance of these introductory verses and their connection to the structure and the content of Sefer Dvarim. So what uh, Rav Sabato wants to do here is focus on these first five psukim. Okay, and he's going to focus on a very particular aspect of these first five psukim. First of all, the fact that they end with lemor, right? That this is saying, this is now a quotation for Moshe, the speech, that's the big part. But what happens in these few psukim? How does it set up the book? So first of all, again, I'm using Atar Tanakh as a tool because I'm looking at the psukim, um, and I can click through to see the Parsha name. So the first thing that he talks about in the article that we don't have time to discuss is the listing of the words in Pasuk Aleph, the, the places in Pasuk Aleph. Ba'arava, Mosuf, Ben Paran, Ben Tofu, Valavan, Vachatzerot, Vedizaha. And here he refers to a very famous machloka between Rashi and Rashbam about whether these places are actual places or they're reference to events and they are tochacha, rebuke for Bnei Israel. Now, of course, using the site, it's very easy for me to look at Rashi and Rashbam as I'm looking at the psukim. That's one aspect of the tool. The other aspect, and again, if I said before what I did was completely unfair, uh, when it comes to understanding the Parsha name, this is even worse because Herzog has spent tons of time and effort in creating this amazing part of the site, which is the maps. Okay, when I go to the maps, um, I can open up this biblical map that is, uh, has a division and a toolbar where you can see different eras of uh, biblical history and which cities are related to each, to each era. So to use it to say, are these particular uh, places here on the map, it's a completely unfair example of the power of what the map has done. Again, Shuki is like cringing because I'm not showing the capabilities that they've built uh, in the map. It really is amazing. I made a choice that it wasn't what I was going to focus on now, but there is a lot to learn uh, from the maps. Instead, uh, I want to talk about the next thing that, uh, uh, that Rav Sabato does in this article. What he does is focus on a repetition within the introduction. And that repetition is this. Asher diber Moshe, it says this is what Moshe spoke. And then again, um, it says um, diber Moshe b'nei Israel, right? And then as we saw from Dr. Dr. Tikachinsky before, it says Moshe be'er. Three times it repeats that Moshe is talking, diber, diber, be'er. And Rav Sabata wants to understand this particular aspect of the repetition. And his solution, again, on one foot, uh, is that this introduction introduces the different aspects or the different sections of the book. And he goes on to explain, or, or, or what he claims is, in order to understand the introduction, you need to understand the structure of the book. Okay? And here I want to emphasize that if you look at these articles, you're going to find that word structure all the time. Right? There's lots of articles in, on Atar Tanakh, especially the opening of a book, like the beginning of Sefer Dvarim, that talk about the structure of the book. And now, and that's because that's a big part of the way they learn there. And he says that these three introductions relate to different parts of the book. And now we have what I think is one of the most significant tools um, that they call a tool, toolbar on the site, and that is the division of the book into sections. Okay. And here it says the entire book is the historical overview, the mitzvot address, the covenant, and then Moshe's farewell. That's the entire book. And Rav Sabato talks about how this introduction relates to the book. And he says this introduction in the middle, Diber Moshe, this is talking about Arba'im Shana. This is the introduction to the historical overview that's about to come in chapters 1 through 4. 
But the first words, Ela Hadvarim Asher Diber Moshe, that's introducing the, the heart of the book, which is the mitzvah address. Okay, and then he runs into a question, but what about Be'er Moshe? That sounds like it's also introducing the mitzvot address. So Rav Sabato has a lengthy explanation to uh, clarify what the difference is between Diber and Be'er. And part of what he claims is that Diber is the oral Torah and Be'er, from the language of carving, he traces the etymology to the language of carving, is about the writing of the book. And even though they both introduce the mitzvot, they are also demonstrating the movement in Sefer Dvarim from the Torah as being spoken and taught to being written down, uh, to being written down uh, as a written work. And that's the arc. And that arc is very easy to explain and jump around when I look at, uh, when I look at the structure of the book that's clearly uh, outlined on the top. And when I click through, I jump to those spots. And usually the jumping works, which is good. Um, and I can, I can compare those psukim, which of course we're not going to do right now. Okay, so um, this is one sort of journey through Atara Tanakh and demonstrating some of the tools that are available. But I now want to put that um, in my last three minutes uh, to, uh, in, in a different context at, or into a broader context. I want to say it like this. We already talked about how Herzog and Tanakh are global content leaders for the contemporary religious Tanakh study. Okay, but it, at the more for, certainly for those of you who are students uh, in this institution or have been here uh, for any amount of time or read articles, you understand that it's not just contact. There is an outlook and an approach. Pshat, structure, mivne, connection to the land of Israel. There are certain principles that come back again and again, even though the teachers don't necessarily agree. The articles don't actually uh, necessarily fall in line. However, there is certainly commonality in purpose and approach. And it's that outlook and approach that can lead to a methodology, a methodology that's repeatable and demonstrable. And that's where what I'm trying to demonstrate here is the type of content that we have on Atara Tanakh very naturally lends itself to tools that will facilitate both understanding of broader structure and close reading of psukim, which I demonstrated a little bit, but there's a lot to do there in terms of close reading of psukim. That, I think, opens up in particular what we expect or what we're looking for as classroom teachers, tools that allow for close reading and demonstrating uh, structure. Those, I think, open up the discussions that my colleagues will have for their tools that help with close reading and understanding psukim. Um, and I think that's uh, a way of sort of framing what it is that Atar Tanakh does do and can do. I'll just close um, uh, with saying, as we think about what we heard in Sefer Tevarim and the movement of Moshe Rabbeinu and how he teaches, what I would suggest is that one of the chidushim, one of the innovations of Moshe Rabbeinu in Sefer Tevarim is actually in the way he structures it. If the mitzvot aren't his, it's the way he structures and conveys that message to us, his students. And that, I think, is the, one of the most uh, uh, significant teachings that Sefer Dvarim gives us and allows us to move from Moshe Be'er teaching us the Torah to Atem Kitvu Lachemet Hashirazot for us having the ability to write our own Sefer Torah and understanding our own role in our Limud. Thank you. Thank you. Well, everyone. Um, just uh, quickly before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge um, there are uh, um, two people here that um, um, I wasn't, actually wasn't expecting we're going we're to be here. Both of my parents are here, and my mother was actually my first Tanakh teacher. And um, so I'd just like to acknowledge, acknowledge their presence. Um, a second, uh, second word of introduction, um, I studied here um, by Rav Luchensin for, uh, for two years in the Gush, another few years in, in Machon Gross. And certainly, the um, alatorah.org site is uh, heavily influenced by Rav Luchensin's methodology. Those of you who are familiar with the site um, probably, probably know that a lot of what the site does is setting up spectrums of different positions, of different parshanim, um, comparing, contrasting them, seeing the advantages, disadvantages, showing um, and illuminating uh, the gray um, areas in between, in between the poles in all sorts of bright colors, um, basically, um, so that uh, a lot of that is a credit to um, to Marie Rabbi uh, Rav Lichenstein. 
Um, since um, I, um, but I, can, I can thank Daniel for, for sort of introducing us, um, Parashat Zvarim. I think we both thought we had this great idea since nobody here de deals with Parashat HaShavua. So we had this creative idea that we deal with Parashat Zvarim. Um, and that's what, um, that's what I'd like to do. Like da um, as, as Daniel also did, this isn't going to be a full treatment of, of, of the site. Um, for those, everyone's welcome to be in touch with us uh, by email or uh, other ways of, of communication, but we're always happy to answer, answer questions to how to make the site more useful for, um, for, for people and especially for educators. Um, but what we'll try to do is um, highlight some of, the, some, of, some of the aspects of the site, some of the tools and, um, and technology that the site, that the site offers that, that's helpful for, for education. One, just one um, other introductory point, the site is intended to be a platform for your learning, for your development. So even though there's a lot of content on the site, even though there's a lot of developed um, shiurim um, or uh, analyses, but um, really what it is, is it's intended to be modular, that you can take pieces from it, you can build your own chidushim, your own, your own classes. And I'd like to take a couple examples of that. So we're gonna go to, um, um, from, Sorry, um, I don't know what that's from. Um, so we're going to go to the to the homepage here. On the bottom of the homepage, if everyone wants to, they can follow on cell phones also, um, or or just follow uh, follow on the screen here. Um, so there are a number of the tools, not all the tools on the site, but a number of the tools at the bottom, the buttons, um, and not this mouse. Um, so Parsha Topics, Parsha Nudin Art, Mikrot Gizalot, Visual Concordance, Tanakh Lab, and Shas Gadol. These are some of the, some of the tools we can, you can uh, um, explore, explore them. So we're going to go though to Study Topics, where by Parshiot, Sefer Dvarim, Parashat Dvarim, we're going to click on Parashat Dvarim. And Daniel spoke a little about organizational uh, structure, so we, we, we actually try to do that also on our Torah. So we have different Um, in the back. Anybody know how to do that? Thanks. Um, so there are different types of different types of topics on the site. We're going to take a look um, at a couple, at the biblical parallels, and and uh, though the core topics, the plot topics, um, those are what I would recommend anyone who's not familiar with the site to to, to take a look at uh, on your own. So we're going to take a look at um, a couple of the topics in, in, in Parashat Zvarim. And basically the questions I'd like to um, address here is what's Moshe Rabbeinu doing in his, um, in his farewell address of Sefer Dvarim, and particularly in this first parasha in the historical um, uh, section of his, of, his, um, of his address. Moshe Rabbeinu is retelling events that we've heard about in previous Svarim. Why is he choosing the events that he tells? Why is he ordering them a certain way? For example, we know that in Perak Aleph of, Sefer Dvar, of Parashat Zavarim, um, so if we go to, so we'll, we'll go to, and, uh, um, Battles with Sichon and Og, and we'll open up on the parasha side in the topic, so we'll have the parasha come up, so in, in a second, hopefully. So in Perak Aleph, he deals with the story of the Meraglim. That's the second year in the Midbar. In Perak Bet, he goes to the 40th year, where Bnei Yisrael um, passed by Seir, Amon, and Moab. And then in Perek Gimel, um, we have the battles with Sichon and Og, 40th year in the Midbar. Then a couple of Prakim later, he goes back to Mamad Har Sinai, Chet Egel. So Moshe's all over the place from a chronological perspective. So why is Moshe ordering Sefer Dvarim that way? Moshe Rabbeinu also, when he retells the events, so there's a lot of material that he adds, a lot of material that he subtracts, a lot of material that some, sometimes even changes, sometimes even apparent contradictions. Why is Moshe doing that? So we're going to take a look um, at open comparison table at a couple of these parallel topics. Um, one of them is Sichon and Og. So this parallel um, topic opens on the right side. You can expand it. Um, and then we have a couple buttons up on top. One allows you to see the parallels between the two sides. Basically everything that's the same. That's a little less interesting for us. Um, but then we're going to take a look at Bimidbar only or Dvarim only. And for our purpose, since we're a little short on time, we're going to go to just the Dvarim only. And we're going to see that in the um, co um, comparison of the counts of the battles with Sichon and Og, so we'll see that there's different elements that are only found in Sefer Dvarim that haven't been mentioned before. 
Now that's interesting, because in a recapitulation, one would expect that one would have heard everything already. But Moshe Rabbeinu is giving us all sorts of new details. For example, um, so, um, Pasuk Yudalov here, Ki rak og melech habashan nishar mi yetzar harifaim, hinei arso eres barzel halo hi barabat b'nei amon, teisha amot orka ve'arba amot rochba ba'amadish. Um, so Moshe Rabbeinu, in this, uh, he has, you know, 30 days left uh, of his life. He's got a short, short amount of time, but he's going to tell us about Og's bed or crib, depending on uh, different nefarshim, um, where it is in Rabat ben Amon. Details that seem fairly extraneous um, to, uh, to us. Um, we're going we're to skip briefly to, um, skip from this topic to, um, back to, um, we'll go back to Parshat Dvarim, and we're going to see that there's similar type, um, type examples in encounters with Esav, Moab, and Ammon in Bamidbar and Dvarim. Here too, open comparison table, and we'll expand it so we'll be able to see it, and we'll look at Dvarim only. So here we have, when they travel um, B'nai Yisrael journey t until they got to Sichon and Og's lands, so they cross by the lands of Esav, Moab, and Ammon. And We'll pick it up in Pasuk Tet. Passing by Moab, and Hashem says, can't touch them. Then Pasuk Yod, Suddenly we get all these details about nations we've never heard about. We've actually heard about them once in the Torah before, in, in Bereshit, but certainly not in the, in the context of B'nai Yisrael's journey in the Midbar. We have the Eimim, we have uh, Rifaim, we have the Chorim, in the next section, when they cross to, um, when they uh, come close to Ammon, we have a similar pasuk. In pasuk kaf, Eretz Rifaim Tei Chashev Avhi, Rifaim Yashavuva Lefanim, Vehaamonim Yikra'u Lahem Zamzumim. Am Gadol Verav Aram Ka'anakim, Vayashmidim Hashem Ipinahem, Vayirashum, Vayishavu Tachtan. Kashar Asal Livnei Yisav, Vayoshavim Beseir, Asher Yishmid Et HaChorim Ipinahem, Vayirashum, Vayishavu Tachtan, Ad Ayom Azeh. So we have these Eimim, we have these Zamzumim, we have the Chorim, these nations who even in Moshe Rabbeinu's time have already been consigned to the dustbin of history, no longer relevant even in Moshe, Moshe's time. And here Moshe feels the need to tell B'nai Yisrael about it and Lidorot to record these, um, to record these psukim. So these, t these types of tables highlight the questions as to when we compare B'midbar and Dvarim, being able to turn on and off the parallels and see what's in B'midbar only, what's in Dvarim only, what are the parallels between the sections. Um, so that, those highlight um, those types of questions. They make it useful. Yeah, question? Right, the yellow, yellow is Dvarim only. That's how you see how the button's marked yellow um, there. Bimidbar, Bimidbar would be blue, right? Blue and Bimidbar only blue. Only in that Pasha? Only in Bimidbar. That content is only in Bimidbar, not in Dvarim. Right, it's not, it's not a, a, a regular parallel t t um, table would have just the, would turn those both off, and you'd have just the parallels. But here, it's, exactly, because that's much more important than the parallels in this case. The parallels just sort of give you the skeleton so you can see that these things are parallel. But the more important part for your class, if you're teaching Sefer Dvarim, is you want to show what's only in Sefer Dvarim. So we've seen all of these details in Sefer Dvarim that are Dvarim only. So now I'd like to, yeah. Who's the editor behind you, like, making up the parallels? Um, the the Alat Torah. I mean the site. Um, the, um, I guess she's is that, is that, who are the people that work on the site? Um, there's there's a, a, a small small team of people. I'm one of them, um, and uh, there there are a couple uh, a couple a couple other educators. Uh, there's an advisory board. If you if you look, I, I don't want to take the time now, but if if you go to the um, to the information icon, who we are, um, you'll see you'll see everyone you'll see everyone everyone who's involved. Um, so, um, yeah, so we, we just have, uh, uh, um, sorry, I just don't want don't, don't to use the limited time on that. Um, okay, so that's, so that's some of the questions that I want to open up from, from Sefer Dvarim. And then what I'd like to do now 
is skip away from the main site, which is the topics, and go to one of the, one of the tools that, uh, that we've been developing. And I want to mention that um, this is, um, this is, we recently um, upgraded this tool, and I want to thank, actually, um, Rav, Rav Shuki and um, um, Yonit, Yonit Sadan, who's also, also with us, um, and who gave, who gave a lot of good ped pedagogical input. And so some of the improvements that we'll be able to see today are, um, are, are thanks to their, some of their good suggestions. So we're going to go to tools. From the main site, you can always access any of the tools, the Mikro Gadol, which we'll see soon. Um, concordance, search engine, and we're going to go to Tanakh Lab. Tanakh Lab is actually a lab which is being built. Right now, we're only going to see a couple of the tools on, on the lab. There's a number of, number of other tools which are, which are being developed. And what you can do in this tool is you can choose any up to seven prakim in Tanakh. We're going to choose Sefer Dvarim because we're looking at that, and Perek Aleph, Pasuk Aleph, until Perek Gimel, and we're going to end it at the end of um, uh, Parashat Dvarim, which would be Pasuk Kafbet. So now on this uh, right side, we have, we, have all par we have all Parashat Dvarim. That's not such a big deal. Um, and on the left side, we have something very interesting. We have a table. What's in this table? So this table contains every word, every term that's in, the par that's in the your selected unit, in our case, Parashat Dvarim. And it tells you how many times it appears in this unit. Now we'll see in a second why we care about that. Um, and um, we'll, we'll actually click on, and you can organize this table in different ways. One way is baketa. So if I click on baketa, it will now tell us in, um, for each term which, is the, which appears the greatest number. So we'll see that the terms Natan and Eretz appear most commonly in Sefer Dvarim. Now, since we all know... In this selection or in I'm sorry, in Parashat Dvarim, in these, in these three prakim, this, uh, this selection. Right. Um, so... Um, so that's not a big surprise to us because we know that these prakim are certainly talking about nitinata aretz. Um, but before we rush to conclusions as to how significant this is, we're going to take a look now at the next column. The next column tells us how frequent, relative, how the relative frequency of this term in this unit compared to the rest of the book of Sefer Dvarim. And we'll see it's 1x. 1x means bad, low score. It means that it's just as frequent in this unit. It's nothing special about these words in this unit than the rest of the book. Now, if you want the full calculations, so we can open up that, you click on the 1x, and it will give you the full, full numbers if you, if you want to go through everything and how, how you calculate the P1. You just, it's simple, simple multiplication and division, and then you'll have the list of psukim where the Shoresh of Natan appears in Sefer Dvarim. Similarly, for Tanakh, and we'll see it's a little more significant compared to Tanakh, it's 3x already, um, but not so significant. And that's why that um, the algorithm which is still being worked on for this column here, it's a 41, not such a high dirug, not such a high score. Now we're going to click on Tanakh now, and we're going to reorder the table now by how, how, sig how significant as far as relative frequency, how special the words are in this unit from the rest of Tanakh. And hopefully we're going to see why this is important. What this shows us is that we have three words, three or three roots actually, Yerusha, Gimel Reish Hei, and Ayin Nun Kuf, which appear much, much more frequently here, meaning relatively to its size. Everything is relative to size, right? Because if I'm, only, if I'm analyzing um, one pasuk and it appears once, so it's going to be different than if I'm analyzing seven prakim and, appears, and it appears once. So it appears, so Yerusha appears 98 times as frequently in this keta as it does in the rest of, in the rest of Tanakh. A Gimel Reishe, 56 times. And again, if you click on those tables, so you'll get the, you'll get the full calculations. We're going to look at Anak. Um, because it, when, you have, when you crunch all these numbers, sometimes it gives you useful data. Sometimes data is not so useful. And there's, we still need people in this world. Ten minutes. Um, so, so if we look at Ayin Nun Kuf, so we see that this word comes up four times in our unit, six times in Sefer Dvarim. So two-thirds of the instances of Anak in Sefer Dvarim are here, and only 18 times in all of Tanakh. Now we're going to take a look at the Psukim. And what do we see? Where does Anak come up in Tanakh? What parasha is that? What story? 
Meraglim, right? Parshat Shlach. Efes ki az ha'ame yoshev baritz veharim b'tzrot gudol mod v'gam yelidei ha'anak reinu sham. Shlach. V'sham reinu ta nefilim b'nei anak min ha'nefilim. Shlach. Good. Now we get to our psukim from Zvarim. Ana anachnu olim, achinu heimasu et levaveinu lemor am gadol varam imenu agrim gadol de v'tzrot sham gam b'nei anak anakim reinu sham. That's by us. Referring to the, the story of the Meraglim. Then we get to our psukim from before. Ha'emim lefanim yashivuva am gadol v'rav v'ram ka'anakim. Rifa'im yechashivu afheim ka'anakim. Am gadol v'rav v'ram ka'anakim. Vayashmidei mashem mipenehem vayirashum vayishavu tachtam. Now we can see that what is Anakim doing? Anakim is a key word. Anakim is a word that opens up a milat maftech, which opens up the whole unit here, the whole section, the whole narrative, the whole address of Moshe, uh, Moshe's address in Sefer Dvarim. What's Moshe Rabbeinu? What does he know? When Bnei Yisrael are coming to their Al Saf Kenisat Haaretz, what messed everything up 38 years before? The Anakim. The Anakim was what the people saw, and they said, we can't compete with the Anakim. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I'm going to tell you all of these extrane seemingly extraneous details about the Zamzumim and the Imim and the Chorim, which we think are irrelevant. But that was exactly the message that Moshe Rabbeinu was trying to convey to the people, that these Anakim are conquerable. These Anakim, Hashem conquered each one of, for each one of Amon, Moab, and Edom. Hashem had to get rid of those same type of Anakim that he's going to get rid of for you. Am gadol varam b'nei anakim, asher atay yadat aviyata shamata, mi yichatsev lifnei b'nei anak, and how does the, how does, how does the pasuk continue? V'yadata hayom, ki Hashem elokecha, hu ha'uver lefanecha, hu yashmideim, hu ha'uver lefanecha yishokla, hu yashmideim v'hu yachniyeim lefanecha, v'horashtam v'abatam maher k'asher diber Hashem lach. So what the keyword tool allows you to do is get a sense of what are the key words in the text which allow you to understand the message of the text. It doesn't, you have to check. Not every key word, not everything that comes up on the table is always going to be helpful, but what it allows you to do is these computations would take, if you were doing them on your own by hand, it would take you, um, it would take me at least, uh, a long, 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 long time. So that's an example of, of, one, of the, one of the tools, one of the ways we can harness technology in order to do things that we could never ever do by hand. Yeah. Does it, does it, I'm looking quickly, I'm not sure, yeah. but does it also pay attention to varied meanings? For example, Shira Shirim, you have Anakim, would that be counted in this? Right, yeah, so th thank you, that's, that's good. So if you look, so we're gonna, we're gonna click actually on one of those, so if you click on the table, it highlights the words in the text, so we're gonna click, so Anakim's on a yellow, it's a little hard to see probably, but we're gonna click on Anakim, so it will, you, you'll see on the bottom here, Tsura, Shoresh, and Ichud. So th there's tremendously powerful capabilities in here. I'm not getting into all of them right now. Everyone who wants to, click on your own, because we're, we're, we're gonna run out of time. You can choose. If you choose Shura, the, num Shura, the numbers will change. If you choose Ihud, the numbers will change. You'll see they, ch they change on the fly. And then you click on each one of these and you can see what all the places in Tanakh. So, so play, play around with it. This is, like I said, this is a, uh, this, this is a platform for you to come up with your Chidushim, um, a lot more than it is for us to present our, our Chidushim. Now, five minutes? So what I'd like to do, though, is take, um, is take a quick look at one of the other important tools. Um, you can always access um, the main tools from the alatorah.org. So we're going to go to the Mikrot Gedolot home, and we're going to take a look at the Haftarah, because Daniel didn't do that. <laughs> so we're going to take a look at Nevi'im, Yeshayahu, and Perak Aleph. Chazon Yeshayahu ben Amot, Asher Chazal Yehuda v'Yerushalayim, v'imei Uziyahu Yotam Achaz Yechiz Kiyam Alchei Yehuda. Now, most of us grow up um, with um, the Mechilta, which Rashi cites here, um, that the first, first Nevoah of Yeshayahu was not Perak Aleph, but rather, rather Perak Vav. Um, the, um, the, uh, um, you, uh, the Perak that we know from the Haftarah Parashat Yitro, Kadosh Kadosh, Hashem Sabakot, um, Vayret Hashem Yosheb Al Kisei Ram Benisa. And Perak Aleph, we assume, is being told, is, um, by, is being prophesied by Yeshayahu in the time of Chizkiyahu. Now one of the things that our Mikrot Gedolot does, which is, um, which is one, one of our, our areas of, of expertise, is it focuses on two, two chronological periods 
which were probably the most significant periods in history for the development of Pshat Parshanot. One of them probably everyone would guess, and that would be 12th century France. Rashbam, Rav Yosef Khorshor, that's the more famous, famous Tzkufa, the Pashtanim of northern France. And what the, our site contains is a lot of their Parshanim from manuscripts, a lot of their Parshanut that hasn't been known, was never been published until now. Um, the second time period, though, is 19th century and early 20th century Italy. Who knows? Shadal. And when Shadal had a, had a student or a semi-student whose name was Rabbi Moshe Yitzhak Ashkenazi. And he wrote a perush called the Ho'il Moshe. Unknown perush, I suspect that not too many people in this room have used them, used them very extensively. Um, so one of the, one of the things that, that we do is we try to curate um, a curated collection of parshanim. Because if one has a million parshanim, so it's very hard, to, uh, very hard to do that. Now we try to give options. So if you go to the gear menu, so you'll have uh, a nice selection of different, uh, of different parshanim. Um, but in, in, in Torah, you have, you have even more. Um, but what I'd like to, sh to, to just give in the last couple minutes that we have is an example of how having a, um, a, a good set of parshanim and a good spectrum of parshanim can make all the difference in creating a class. Um, in this case, the Perush of Rabbi Ezra Mibalagansi, who was a student of Rashbam, is very, very critical. Because um, what Rabbi Ezra Mibalagansi does is he takes the opposite approach to the approach that we know from Rashi, Mechilta, Chazal. Rabbi Ezra Mibalagansi says the entire book is in chronological order. And he says, it's very simple. Shabbat chilabi mei uzia. That's our first pasuk. V'achar kach bishnat mot hamelech uziyahu. Yeshayahu vav. Now, we can't go through all of the psukim and all the implications, but if you then trace how Rabbi Ezra Mibalagansi learns all Parak Aleph, and of course other Prakim in the book, so he will have a diametrically opposed um, approach to understanding all these psukim than Rashi. Um, so having that northern French contrast between Rashi and Rashbam, Rashi Rav Yosef Kara, Rashi and Rabbi Yazami Balagansi will sometimes be critical in giving the class a, a, uh, a, a good polls, good polls, a good contrast, um, and a, a good way of setting up, um, uh, of setting up one's, um, um, one's, one's classroom. Um, as uh, there's lots of, um, lots of other, for each one of these tools, so there's a madricha mishtamesh in the corner there, um, there's any, you can click on any word and get uh, concordance results, all sorts of tools um, that you can play around with, um, that you can enjoy in, in, these, um, in, the, in the different resources on, on, on the site. And one thing I would ask is that um, um, we, we're constantly releasing um, new tools, new updates, um, there's this very, very simple way of keeping posted, of, of keep allowing us to, uh, to be in contact. Hey Rashem, if you subscribe, Tzor Kesher, um, use those buttons, subscribe even now. Um, and, um, when, and that way, as soon as, every, every time we, we have new tools coming out, so you'll, you'll be able to get them. Yeah. So, Bokar uh, thank you everybody. Um, I'm happy to be here for two reasons. One, I get to deal with my uh, favorite topic, which is Torah. And secondly, I get to dress up uh, fancy. Um, <laughs> it always works. <laughs> um, so, two questions. Who have heard of Sephari before? Who have used Sephari before? Who have used Sephari as source sheets before? Thank you very much. I'm going. Um, so, the topic of, uh, and you'll have to excuse my English. I'm not a native English speaker. I'm a Baladi Israeli. Um, so the topic of the of this 25 minutes that we have is is a bit about technology, pedagogia, and sefaria. Um, the vision of sefaria, as we can see here, is creating the future of Torah. By creating the future of Torah, we don't intend to rewrite the Torah or suggest anything like that. But we think that digital age calls for us to do something else in terms of the way we approach Torah and the way we all. Um, trend this Torah, um, and we sh would say that technology is freedom as it sets teachers and learners free. And, uh, and that's the way I want to think when we talk about technology in the context of Safaria. We're not alone in the field, we're not the, you know, we're 
part of a you know, growing numbers of, of organizations like we've heard Al-Atorah, al Tanakh, and other big organizations uh, that people are using. Um, but I want to say, how do we know that uh, technology sets, sets us free? So obviously, um, I'm not gonna st I knew that you were going to do a Parashat Shavua, so I did something else. <laughs> so we did some uh, Pirkei Avot, right? So we all know the famous Midrash on Pirkei Avot. Uh, of Rabbi Yoshua, Amichtav, Michtav Elohim, Mucharut al Aluchot, Al Tikri Charut, El Acherut. And the tablets were the work of God, and the written were written of God, graven upon the tablets, do not read graven, but rather freedom. And we do believe that technology allows us, teachers and learners, free in the way we can dream about how we want to teach uh, Torah in the Biri aspect. Um, so I want to refer. Just not take 97 seconds of your time um, to hear one of the greatest Jewish scholars of our time. Um, as I created this source sheet, I found out that in Gimatria, 97 seconds is Pua Dov, we need a Poo, and which is uh, what he's going to talk about, Torah and Vash. Uh, <laughs> Sepharia is one of my favorite things in the entire contemporary Jewish world. It is taking cutting-edge technology and doing something very spiritual by it. What it is doing is opening up the rich treasury of our texts. We, the people of the book, the people that never stop writing and commenting on books. And it's opening that up to all Jews and indeed everyone, everywhere. And secondly, it is allowing that extended conversation to be trackable, like one text begets another text, and all the voices of our history are in conversation, trying to decode what God is trying to tell us about how we ought to live. And uh, Safari in general is just brilliant, but this new program that William Davidson Talmud, putting online and making available the brilliant Adin Steinsal's Hebrew and English translations of the Talmud is just magnificent. The Talmud belongs to all of us. It is our shared heritage. And because of Safaria, it is now really accessible anywhere by anyone. So you've done something really, really important here. You fulfill the mitzvah of Talmud Torah and makes the sacred Torah, the Safari of our people and our soul, available through this great technology across the world. Well done. I have a lot of things to do this So now I can go. Um, so I want to share a few of our challenges. Um, by the way, this is an open discussion, so you don't have to wait until the end because we won't have time at the end. Uh, they'll just kick us to the next panel. So if you have any questions, just feel free. I'll continue from there. So uh, five major challenges that we have. Um, the first one is what are the platforms which Torah is being shared, is being taught today. And we do believe and we want to create a platform where Jews all over the world are sharing their own Torah. I can, when writing my own uh, shiur on Parashat HaShavua, whatever topic I choose, I can see what was written in Odessa, what was written in Buenos Aires, what was written in London, in Melbourne. And in, in that way, I think we, we can contribute to the fact that the way the Torah is being taught and shared, too. How does Safari help change the user experience? Uh, of the teachers and learners. We are, we are at the age where everything is, most of the things are measured by the user experience. We want to have great user experience. We want to rethink the way the user experience we're uh, doing when we teach. And, and that's something that Safari allows us to make even better, uh, create a better user experience using our, uh, both the library and the source sheet. Uh, three, does the digital aid change the learner's intimacy uh, experience with the text? I've been hearing more and more, and we're all part of a generation that asks the question. So I'd say my, my opinion. Yes, books are the best things ever. There's nothing like opening a book, learning from a book, teaching for a book. The question is, is it available? Is it accessible? Does everybody have it? Does it do we have enough resources uh, in order to do it? And if not, so the second best thing is to try to develop a digital intimacy which is something that I think we should ought to think about, digital intimacy with text using mobile devices. I've been, uh, over the last year, I've been doing an experiment of teaching uh, a group of 18-year-olds uh, only using mobile 
instead of printing the text, just using it on mobile, and I'll show uh, what are the benefits of that. Uh, the fourth question we're asking ourselves, how does Safari change the way we learn? Now that 2,400 uh, books are available on my mobile phone from everywhere, how does it change the way I teach? I gave a training uh, a, in the beginning of the year in one of the Mechinot um, Gdam the pre-leadership uh, programs in Israel, and the Rosh uh, Mechina came to me afterwards and said, first of all, thank you very much for, for the service you gave us. B, you made my life miserable. Because whenever I start a shiur, there's a chanich, there's a talmid sitting at the end of the class and saying, no, it's, it's not Sanhedrin Tzadik Zayin, it's, uh, it's, it's something else. So we, we should think about it, because it changes the way we teach, because we, you know, we can be checked. And uh, um, so in a way, what we're doing uh, continuing is from Chazal to the digital, right? We're not inventing everything. We're a, con a mere continuation from the Torah that God, God gave Moses on Sinai and through the lineage uh, they were before us and hopefully they will be after us. Um, but So I want to say a, a few things about what Safaria is. But just with a short, a, a, again, one of my favorite Dvar Torah on Nedarim, is that Izaru bivne aniim shemeim tetzet Torah, right? Uh, be careful with regard to the education of the sons of the paupers, as it from them that Torah will issue forth. And this is something very unique. I need an act again, MRI, and I'll be good. Um, so, what is Safaria? So, Safaria is free. It's just the true nature, like the true nature of Talmud Torah. We want to make it free. We want to make every, and I, when I'm saying free, I'm not saying as opposed to anybody else who charges 1,000 shekels a year for their services. That's a, just a totally different uh, business model. Thanks for a lot of generous people and foundations that, that support Safari, the work, uh, and individuals that support the, 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 the existence of Safari makes the fact that we can open it to everybody. Not only that it's free, we intend that the texts that are on Safari, that the books are on Safari, will be open uh, for everybody to use, reuse, print, reprint, and do whatever you want with it. That's part of our mission. Not only to just put it on Safari, but make sure that everybody can use it as in the way they want. Secondly, like Rabbi Sachs said, we expose, uh, Safari helps you expose the di dialogic uh, nature of Jewish study. If I want to open a pasuk and I see what people throughout generations from different diasporas, from different places thought and said about it, including contemporary ones, that exposes the way we want to think about the way we learn. We're not bounded by one commentator. We're not bounded by a few commentators. We can scroll ourselves around and I, and the best quote I can find for that is that what Baal Shem Tov said about the Torah. The Baal Shem Tov said that the Torah comes from the world to tour, right? T-O-U-R, la tour, which is the same in Hebrew and English, and we can go on a journey using Safaria and start with a Pasuk on Tehillim to a Midrash from Eicha Rava to a Mishnah to a Hasidic and lose yourself and find yourself in a new way of learning Torah because it's just accessible. Beside the fact that we have 2,400 uh, 2, books written by 250 authors, we also have 123,000 soul sheets that were created by 5,500 individuals and growing by about 7,000 soul sheets a month. Uh, in order to make our Torah shareable. So that's two. Uh, has no hierarchy. Uh, and when, I'm say, when I say there's no hierarchy, yes, I'm an anarchist. But, <laughs> I, and I don't mean to, uh, to say something bad about the place that Rashi has in our, in our history and tradition, but everybody can write his own commentary. And we can think about new ways of introducing Torah commentary to our, to our students comparing different commentaries, and, I, and I'll show a few things. So I uh, said about, allows teachers to teach differently. Uh, the first, we think that within our, I think our aim in Israel at least, that within the next three years, about 75% of schools in Israel will be using Safaria. And when I say use Safaria, it's gonna be a spectrum between a teachers that comes into the class and says, Shmuel open, the book of Shmuel, and Shmuel forgot his Tanakh at home, so he op opens his app and just finds the text, until writing curriculums based on Safari. We're doing a few experiments in Israel with the Ministry of Education. We've uploaded a few uh, one Torah Shebaal Peh curriculum for 11th and 12th grade. The next year, we're going to experiment with 150 
teachers and 2,000 students to learn from them how they use Safari and how is it effective, how it helps the way teachers teach students learn. And but also what it does, it helps the teacher to teach uh, their, their students in their own learning preferences. So our source sheet builder allows you a teacher to combine an infinite source sheet where you can combine different kinds of media. If we're not bounded just to uh, uh, psukim and prakim and words and sentences, we can implement audio and video and pictures and you know, self and, and things like that. So we allow different kinds of learning types in the class. Um, make Jewish texts available. We do understand that within the last four years, we've done a lot of work in making them available. But what are we doing in order to make them accessible? Okay, the fact that it is available online, the fact that the Steinzahl's Talmud is available online, doesn't mean that anybody can access it. We need to do something, we the teachers, need to do something in order to help our teachers get over the part that it is available for them, do something in order to make it accessible. How do we teach? What do we create? Uh, we just created, I don't know if you're, uh, if you're, a, if you're, um, Subscribe to Safari. If not, I do recommend that you subscribe. Uh, a few weeks ago, we've, uh, we've uh, developed a new Chrome extension. I don't know if you saw that. That every time you open your Chrome, uh, a Chrome page, it gives you a small Torah. And you can choose if it is a Torah from Tanakh, a Mishnah Yomi, a Rambam Yomi, 9 to 9. And, uh, and people, uh, people, that's an example of how do you make Torah from available to accessible. It's, maybe you wouldn't do it on your free time, every time you open a tab on, on, your, on your browser. But now when you have a small Torah, a Pasuk, a Mishnah, something comes up, it, it definitely uh, changes. Uh, makes Torah study more collaborative and shareable in two ways. One is the fact that when I study Torah, I'm not bounded only for the Mefarshim that, that exist, but only it's interesting to know what teachers are doing different places, and maybe I can learn from them, and they, maybe they can learn from what I'm doing. But also, we can teach in a collo collaborative way. We can just open a, we could just open a, open a source sheet and, and, and instead of creating a source sheet, engage in a kind of learning method with our students where we are re we creating source sheets together, where we put a perek dvarim and they can add their own commentaries, they can add their own mefarshim, they can write their own midrashim, they can add things that are relevant and make Torah relevant to them from where they are. Uh, develop new pedagogics and, and new technologies and the tools that we're creating. So some of the tools I want to demonstrate, um, we, we, we think that over the next few years, we would like to get some more feedback from the fields, from teachers, and understand what is missing or what is needed for them to teach differently using visual tools. So Safari has 1,700 interconnections between texts. We have hundred and over 160 million words uh, in our library. And this is an example, one example of a visual tool. And, but it, and it was developed by one of our uh, engineers. But we're waiting to get feedbacks from the field to understand what are people missing? What if you would have a, how would the tool look like that you will be able to teach differently using visual tools? Uh, better. So this is, uh, we know that there are 30,000 connections, quotes, in the Talmud from the Tanakh. So over here you have all the Tanakh, Torah, Nevin, Torah, Bereshit, um, Bereshit Shmod Veikra, and here you have all the Masachtot, right? All the tractates. Um, and this map shows you the interconnections between everything. So you can see Bereshit, what is it connected, as a, as, and as it grows, the, the, the thread is thicker, there's more Parshaniot Tzitutim. On the website. It's on the, on the website. I'll show you. It's on the website, on the, on the bottom part where it says visual. Okay? So I always show an example of the book of Esther. So when we look at the Megillah of Esther, we see that it's connected with Masechet Megillah, right? But if we go deeper and we'll see all the chapters in Megillat Esther, how it relates to all the Masechtot, we see again that it's connected to Masechet Megillah. But if we go even deeper, we can see the numbers of pages that Ms. Dapim and we see that it's true until number 24 and then it and leaves. Why is it important? 10 minutes, okay. So we can play with this tool. By the end of the summer, we are going to uh, release a new tool where you can uh, go on any Amora in Tana. 
and see who studied from who, who is the chavrut of who, who were the students of who, and hopefully the next layer would be what did he teach. So you go to Rav Shmuel and you can see who were the teachers, who is this chavruta, and what did he teach, where, what, are his, what are his writings. So this is another way of rethinking how technology can help us think and teach in a different way, where it's accessible and where it's visual. What's that going to be called? Mapat Tanaim Vamoraim. Mapat Tanaim and Amoraim. But you can see it at the visual, you will see it. Um, it's going to be both in English and Hebrew. I just want to say about, the, I didn't say, it's the, the, the website was created five years ago. Uh, started with two Jews, Brett. Uh, Lux Speiser, uh, which uh, um, a uh, product manager at Google, and Josh Foyer, who is an, a, a journalist and a, and a writer in the States, because they wanted to make Jewish texts available in English. Uh, so most of our texts are Hebrew and English. There's still a majority of, of Hebrew, as it is the language where <laughs> most of the texts were learned, but we're closing the gap. It will never be closed, by the way, A, because we're running away with <coughs> contemporary and other Jewish uh, Hebrew um, books, but most of the, uh, the majority of the, t we, we say that we want to be the place where 90% of the people find 90% of what they study 90% of the time. So it's yet not a great tool for scholars and uh, PhD students and, and things like that. Sorry. So I, I, I really want this question for all of those that presented, but as a teacher, since you're speaking of teachers, I teach uh, Pirush Rashi, and the font of Rashi, I know is not so fond with you know the current uh, online tools that are being you know presented. Is there any option on any of these um, platforms for using the font of Rashi? The so, um, so the so the uh, the quick answer is yes. Uh, you can take any Rashi commentary, put it on the source sheet, <coughs> and then change the font to Rashi. No, I'm, not, I'm asking for a student who are accessing it. I have many students that access Sephoria or... We don't have this Rashi, you don't, uh, we don't have the Ktav Rashi on Sephoria. <coughs> That's what you're asking? Yeah. We don't have the Ktav Rashi, but you can create, or that you can teach your yeah. students to create the Ktav Rashi and then practice learning from Ktav Rashi as they take the Rashi commentary and turn it the font into a Rashi font. And you, whoop, you have a Rashi font. Um, we found out that less people use it. Um, um, intertext, intertextual connections. We have intertext, 1,700,000 intertextual connections. And I'll give you an example for what I mean by intertextual connections. I'll do it in Hebrew, uh, but it's the same in English. Um, so we go to the Tanakh, we go to Sefer Bereshit. Uh, we press on any Pasuk. Uh, and we can see all the places that are interconnected with Pasuk Aleph Bebereshit. So you can see that you have 206 Mefarshim that have commentary. It's not 260 people, because for example, you have three of Rashi, five of Ibn Ezra, but it's infinite because, so you see one Perush of Rashi on Pasuk Aleph on Bereshit, but if you press the Rashi one, and you can see it now, uh, one alongside, and you'll press again the Rashi, you'll see that Rashi also has quotation citations and, 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 and sends you to other uh, places in the Tanakh, and that's a different, a new and a different way of, of, of learning. Uh, multimedia, um, a source sheet, that I'm giving an example of, uh, we're doing uh, 200 Israeli Tanakh teachers are having next week on Wednesday an hour and a half of Safari online training simultaneously and we're learning about how to create source sheets and teaching about Moshe. So the beautiful thing about a source sheet, which I call a different user experience, is A, when we're, when we're creating a source sheet on a piece of paper, and I'm not talking now on Shabbat, on Chagim, where it's difficult to use um, mobile devices, right? I'm talking about normal, regular days where we teach. So when you create a source sheet, we're always bounded by the size and time, by the fact that we can use only sentences. We're bounded by the amount of text we want to share with our students and how much media can we, can we do it, and how do they consume it? I have uh, three beautiful daughters. Uh, the eldest one is 13, everything she knows, uh, the way she learns from everything, she uses her mobile phone, and I think that's the generation. So creating a source just like this allows you, the teacher, first of all, to play and edit it, add not only the, uh, add 
pictures, questions. Uh, you're not bounded by the amount of text you want to put because once they open from the device and they push the entire perec, they can see all the, they can themselves go on the mobile devices, go to see the different commentaries and start their own journey. The source sheet is not only, it's not the end of the game, it's just the beginning of a journey and we can uh, scroll around and also it allows you Okay, uh, collaborative, as I said, we can create collaborative source sheets with different teachers, online and offline, uh, not only giving them the source sheets, but part of the work we do with them, part of the me new methods of teaching is that we cre create source sheets with our students in a different way that they, they will feel that they own it, that they can add stuff, that they feel connected to it, and it's a different way of, a new and different way of learning it. The source sheet is infinite. You're not bounded by time and space anymore. Uh, it's used on mobile devices, and, and we're pushing that um, as everybody has their mobile device everywhere, it's also a new way of introducing. I always quote, people say, and uh, you're not afraid that students, when they're on mobile, will go to somewhere else. So I always quote uh, the Ruziner, who says that when you take a Yetzer and you break it into, and you break it, you have two Yetzerim. So our assignment as educators in the 21st century is to help students balance between Archavat Adat, right, learning more, and running away to different websites. And how do you create that balance if you don't practice it? Because uh, there's, there's a lot to gain from, from that. Um, two last things. It's not this one. Um, allow students and teach. Can you show us how to make a source sheet quickly? <laughs> no. it, uh, we don't have the time for it, but please. Please send me an email or WhatsApp or call me and I will give you proof. Like if you're here, we give it the service. Everywhere it's free. We have uh, Sarah Wolkenfeld in Chicago, heads of, heads of education and, and anything can be done free and let's be in touch and I'll share with you how you can get that. We have a video, we have a video, tutorial video explains in 15 minutes how to do that and online support okay. 24 and, six. And in America they're creating like a Google Hangout group yeah, yeah. Sarah will guide you. Uh, I, I'm dealing only with Israel. Is Sarah at safaria.org. Yeah. <laughs> as simple as that. Is there a thought to kind of vet the content at any point in the same way Wikipedia has chosen not to let anybody put information of any kind in the point? But once you get so huge, put information to be useful. That, that shorts, shorts, short source sheets or in general? I mean, sources are sources. Russia doesn't need to be vetted. Somebody making whatever the content that people are putting up onto the site, uh, there's a lot of junk out there. <laughs> how do you how do you weed through it? <laughs> <laughs> we're we're not curating. We're not curating the stuff. But it's yes. open for everybody to put. We are monitoring if people are misusing words and doing you know, things that are, shouldn't be on, on, under Safari. But the, 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 uh, as I said, that, that has to do with the, it has to do with the uh, oh, yeah. number three. Right? Everybody can add whatever they want commentary and I can find it interesting. And there are some things that I won't open. And there are things that I would follow, the things that I would read once and I said, no, <laughs> that's not for me. Uh, saying that eventually, for it to continue to be useful, uh, it's going to get, I think, overwhelming, and, and people will stop finding it useful. I just want to understand, are you talking about source sheets or are you talking about commentaries? No, source sheets. Source sheets. Source sheets. Yeah, source sheets. You, you know what, years ago, what... This is the land of the HTML pages. Right. 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 There's a great, great, uh, okay, Slicha Rak, two, two last words, uh, Safari numbers, up to now we have five years, we have about 160,000 unique users a month. There's still a great majority of English speaking uh, users as we launch only in Zain Becheshvan this year. Uh, so 23% of Israeli, of traffic is, comes from Israel, but as we use Hebrew and the amount of schools and potential users, uh, we presume that by the end of 2019, there'll be at least equivalent numbers of Hebrew users. Um, and please contact us, and we want to learn from your experience how we can make your life better and other people's life teaching better. Thank you very much. Yeah.